very much, Mike. Good afternoon to all of you. Congratulations on making it here. Um, I think London Underground didn't want you to find out about pensions, uh, but you made it anyway. Um, the way this is going to work this afternoon is I've got a 20-minute slot, and the idea is that I brief as many of you as possible on what happened behind the scenes for the last five years in terms of pension reform, why the changes were made, and although it's actually over the last five years, a lot of these changes are still happening now or haven't even started yet, so it's still very current. If you've got questions, I'm very happy to answer those, and the idea is that in the 20 minutes, I simply tell you everything I know, which takes about 19 and a half minutes, and then I will head for the uh, exhibition area, and I'm going to stand by the map, so if there's any questions you'd like to ask me, simply don't literally follow me out, but I will be out by, in the exhibition area, very happy to answer any questions, but I'm simply going to share with you for this 20-minute slot. So let's see what I plan to cover. I'm going to try and give you a feel for what's coming down the track in terms of, first of all, why were so many reforms made? What were the problems we were trying to solve? Tell you what's coming in April 2016 with the new state pension, which is obviously going to be quite different, and you hear some quite confusing things. So what's actually going to happen? What's happening in terms of retirement and pension ages and working longer and all of that sort of thing? If you're in work still, what about workplace pensions being put into one of those? A little bit about the budget last year, freedom to use your pension pot as you wish, and then some pointers to where I think there is change still yet to come. And I'm going to try and do all of that without mentioning Lamborghinis. <laughs> so, um, in brief, what were the problems that we were trying to solve? Well, first of all, back in 2010, we had a very, very complicated state pension system. I could take the next 20 minutes trying to describe it to you, and I would use all my time and fail. It was baffling. You know... Um, Two pensions. There wasn't just one state pension, there was two, a basic one and a second one. Some people were in the second one and some people had contracted out of the second one. Um, even if you had a pension, that might not be all you got in retirement. You might get a means-tested benefit on top and the means test had two bits, a guaranteed bit and a savings bit with tapers, etc, etc. It was a nonsense. And what we wanted to move towards was a system that was ultimately simpler so that you knew what you were going to get in retirement and then when you saved, you were better off rather than the government coming along and saying that you saved, oh, look, you've got some savings, so we won't pay your council tax or your rent or whatever. So less means testing and a simpler system. We also had to look at state pension ages, which is controversial and difficult, but if I tell you that the male pension age of 65 had not changed for a century, and if you think of how the world had changed over that 100 years, the last time the male state pension age changed, it went down from 75 to 65. So we were kind of behind the curve. So things had to happen there. In work, if you had a job in the private sector, you only had a one, now I need to do that, one in three. One in three chance of having any pension at all when we started. If you worked for a private firm, two-thirds had no pension at all, and that was getting worse every year. So something had to be done. And then, obviously, the fact that when you had a pension pot, what you could get for that pension pot was getting less and less every year. So we had a few things to solve. Now, I want to concentrate particularly on the new state pension because it's coming next year and a lot of people are slightly confused about what's coming. So let me give you a flavour of what's coming. It starts next April. When it comes in, the whole thing called contracting out will go. So until now, in the past, you could not be in part of the state pension system, not be in the SERPs pension, contract out or your scheme contracted out and you got benefits under another pension scheme. That's all going. So going forward from April 2016, the whole notion of contracting out will end. The new pension, and I'm going to tell you about my kids at this point, I have teenage children, and life will be simple for them because they will start work entirely under the new regime. And for them, if they do 35 years in the system, 35 years of paying national insurance or being credited with national insurance, for example, bringing up children, caring for an elderly relative, they will get the flat pension. And that flat pension will be set just above the level of the means test, which today is about £150 a week, give or take, in round numbers. So the flat pension will be just clear of the means test, say £7,500 to £8,000 a year. And my kids will know that. They will know that with a full working life, that's what they'll get from the government, and that's all they'll get from the government. There won't be SERPs, there won't be contracting out, there won't be anything else. That's what they'll get. And if they want to live in retirement on more than seven and a half to 8000 which I think they will they'll need another pension on top. That's the idea. Now, one of the problems is, when we did this reform, we had no money to spend. The Treasury said, it's fine, you can do the reform, just don't spend any money. Which is what the Treasury always say. 
So the problem is, we want to bring in this shiny new simple pension system, but we can't spend any money doing it. Now, if the pension's going to be 150 quid a week, and you in this room have already built up 170 quid a week, we're not going to take that off you. So, first thing to say, if you've got 170 quid, if you've got a statement from the government saying, I've already built up 170 quid, that is what you will get, not 150. So, we can't immediately move to the 150, because some people are already over it. But there's a second complication. Some people paid reduced national insurance, particularly if you worked in the public sector or for a big private company, you were contracted out. Your scheme paid less NI, you paid less NI, and return for which your scheme promised to replace part of the state pension. So in 2016, we couldn't just say, we will forget about that, because you've got two next-door neighbours, one who was always contracted in, one who was always contracted out. The neighbour who was contracted out has paid less NI for their entire life, because the scheme is replacing part of their state pension, so we couldn't just pay them both the same state pension anyway. So in 2016, there will be a one-off deduction from the state pension for past contracting out, just as there is now. The contract out deduction just as there is now. And the significance of that will come in shortly. So there won't be a basic pension and a second pension and all the rest of it. We're not turning the basic pension of 115 into a basic pension of 150. We're taking the 150 and replacing everything. Basic, SERPs, grad, all the rest of it. The new system will, as it works through, be more generous on average to women, particularly because the way the system treats people who spent time at home with kids will be more generous. It'll be more generous to the self-employed, because the self-employed are currently only in the basic state pension, and in the future they will be in this, this full state pension, and generally more generous to lower earners, less generous to higher earners, which is partly how we pay for the thing. Crucial thing you need to know, if you've not reached state pension age yet and won't before April 2016, so you come under the new system, you need to know your starting amount. And if you're within 10 years of state pension age, I was going to say we can tell you that. It's not we anymore, it's they. It's taken me a while, but I'll get there. They, those swines at the DWP, they can tell you. If you're within 10 years of pension age, you can ask for a statement which will tell you, personalised to you, what you've built up by 2016. And the crucial thing you need to know is it's the higher of two numbers. The question they ask is, what have you already got in the bank under the current rules, and what would you get under the new rules? So the existing calculation, basic pension SERPs, contracted out deduction on the one side, and the new calculation, 35 years for a full pension, lesser deduction for contracting out. Whichever of those two numbers is the highest, that is your starting amount in 2016. If it's already above 150-odd, it won't grow. It will never get more than that other than through inflation, because you've already reached the full amount. If it's under that, then any year you work or pay credits post-2016 can add to the figure you've got. So say you've got 120 quid in the bank, then post-2016, each extra year you work can build you up towards the new flat rate figure. And you can find out what that figure is. You can get that, you can go online, if you go on gov.uk and search for state pension statement, and it will take a couple of weeks to come back but so that you will know where you stand. And already over 100,000 of these statements have been issued. So I, we, they, whoever, are very keen to, to make sure people know that. What else is going on? Working longer. People forget often that a key part of planning for later life is when later life starts. It's kind of obvious, isn't it, really? But basically, the longer you work, the bigger your pension will be. Let me give you one example of that. If you draw a state pension before April next year, or could have done, every one year you put off will give you an extra 10% on your state pension, 10.4. Say 10% on your state pension. That's a huge return. That's roughly double what the actuaries think is the fair rate. So if you are someone who's reaching state pension age before next April, could put off taking a pension, an extra 10%. Now, at this point, I should say I'm not authorised to give financial advice, but well worth thinking about. I think I'm allowed to say that, Mike, am I? Yes, yes, I won't be sued for saying it's well worth thinking about. So putting it off... What's happened? Women's state pension ages were already going up, so what happened was, back in the mid-1990s, a man took the government to court and said, it's not fair, my pension age is 65, a woman born on the same day is 60, it's not fair. The court found in his favour. So in 1995, the government legislated to start that process of equalising men's and women's pension ages so that by 2020, they would equalise at 65. 
What the last government did, I don't know who it was who did it, somebody, um, <laughs> did was, and I, I'm not running away, I'm standing at the back to answer your questions, um, was said, actually, that would still mean that in 2020, men were retiring at 65, which they were a century earlier. So what the last government did was equalised at 65, not in 2020, but in 2018, <coughs> equalised at 66 in 2020, and said 67 would be in the late 2020s. Now, the crucial thing after that is what happens next on all of that. The idea is that from now on, rather than have an ad hoc change, or a government minister stands up and suddenly says the pension age is such and such, there will be a review every five years, and it's already been confirmed the first review will be by 2017, and the principle will be, for every year of your adult life, two-thirds would be spent of working age and one-third in retirement. So if we are all living a year longer than the last time they looked at the figures, the state pension age will go up by eight months and the length in retirement will go up by four months. Now, the funny thing about that is that means, on average, retirements will get longer. Does that make sense? Pension ages are going up, but lives are going up as well. And so actually retirements will be longer, not shorter. It sounds like work till you drop, doesn't it? Keep putting pension ages up. But for every year that people are living longer, eight months will go on pension age, four months will go on retirement. I know of Scandinavian countries who are saying for every extra year people live, a year will go on the pension age. So in fact, the UK is being more, more gentle than that. But it's still, you know, my kids, coming back to my kids again, if their pension age doesn't start with a seven, I'll be astonished but they will probably, God willing, live into their late 90s on average. So that's the kind of world we're going to. So in 2017, there'll be another review. We already know 67 is set for the late 2020s. It currently looks like 20, 68 for the mid-2030s, 69 for the mid-2040s, but none of those will be set in stone because there'll be a five-yearly review, and the only thing you will know is with 10 years' notice what the pension age is. So if you're that bit away from pension age, more than 10 years, it could change until you're within 10 years of pension age. A quick word on people in work. Obviously, for people in work who don't have a pension, big firms now have a legal duty, as long as they earn £10,000 a year and are over the age of 22, to put them in a pension for the firm to put some money in, for the government to put some money in, for the worker to put some money in, and then the individual is free to opt out. And it's been a stunning success so far, even if I say so myself. So over the last five years, five million people have now been enrolled into workplace pensions. And there's another five million to go who work for the smallest firms. And the wonderful news is that 90% have stayed in. So although they are all free to opt out if they want, 90% have stayed in, particularly younger people. Astonishingly, the 20-somethings are the most likely to stay in. Isn't that good news? So 90% staying in. And gradually, the contribution rates into those schemes will build. Um, there are also rules on the quality of these schemes. So when I go on, I do local radio phone-ins, and people ring you up and say, I don't want one of these rip-off pensions. And what we've said is, for these pensions, if you're a worker, if you're put into a workplace pension by your employer, less than a penny in the pound can go in charges. 0.75% goes in charges maximum on these schemes. So it's designed to be value for money with an employer contribution and so, an encouraging change. Freedom and choice is the, is the buzzword for the budget of 2014. I used to go on the television, go on the radio and say, isn't it great, we've got a new state pension, we've got automatic enrolment, we've got high quality, low charge pensions, and all the interviewers would say, yeah, but it's all a bit rubbish. I said, what do you mean, it's all a bit rubbish? And they said, well, you've got to buy an annuity at the end, haven't you? I said, yes. And they say, well, they're a bit rubbish, aren't they? Well, that's slightly unfair. But what has been happening with annuity rates, of course, is they've been coming down dramatically, partly because interest rates are coming down, partly uh, because people are living longer, and basically more and more people were saying, I'm not going to get good value. Now, part of the problem was that the market wasn't working, so you'd saved with an insurance company, and then you just bought an annuity from that insurance company. And in fact, you didn't have to. You could have what's called the open market option, you could shop around and go anywhere, but lots of people didn't. And there were industry codes of good practice and voluntary efforts, and we tried very hard to get people to shop around, and it wasn't working. And in particular, if you have health problems, if you've been a smoker, you should get a bigger pension. But lots of people weren't. So the market wasn't working. It had a bad reputation. So what we decided to do in 2014 was say, right, quotes, you don't have to buy an annuity. You never did quite, but most people ended up having to do so. So what happens now? You've got your pot. And when you go to your provider or your scheme, the first thing they should do is say, have you gone to PensionWise? 
Now, <clears throat> I don't know about you, I get the odd phone call. Anybody here get phone calls? Yeah, I thought it was just me, actually. No, I, I had a phone call from someone the other day and say, oh, hello, sir, um, this is a call about your frozen pension. So I, I pretended I had a frozen pension. Uh, and he said, I don't know whether you know, sir, but the government's changed the rules. <laughs> uh, so uh, I said, oh, how, how have they really? Yes, he said, uh, you know, and um, the government wants people to review their pensions. I said, oh, well, that's interesting. And I said, after a while, I strung it along. And I said, well, actually, do realise I'm the government minister responsible for pensions. And it went a bit quiet. <laughs> and then, bless him, he said, yes, but you might still have a frozen pension. <laughs> so I thought, <laughs> I thought, give that man a pay rise. You know, that's, pre that's pretty good. But, you know, if anybody rings up and tells you it's the government, it ain't. The government is not cold calling people. If they mention the government, it's because they're trying to make you think they are the government, but they ain't. Pension-wise is the brand of the government's free guidance service. It's not regulated financial advice, it's guidance. It's just somebody you can talk to, face to face, or on the phone, or on the website, who will just take you through the basics. How will it be taxed if I take my money? Well, how long might I live? What, do I, what about long-term care? What are these different products? It's that just basic information which is free, it's independent, there is no reason not to use it. So the providers should flag this. But once you've taken the guidance, preferably, and you can, of course, pay for independent financial advice, and if you can afford to do that, it's well worth thinking about doing. At that point, you can, in principle, take the lot and blow it on a... No, sorry, I wasn't going to say that. Um, but, you can, but you do have to be very, very careful. Because, of course, in taking the lot, it's taxed as if it was your income in that year. So if you take a big slug of money, you get taxed as if you just earned a big slug of money. So you have to be careful about that. And there are various changes to the tax relief rules. So if you take a bit of money beyond your tax-free amount, but you're still that bit younger and then think you want to do some more pension saving later, you've kind of complicated your tax position. So you have to think very hard before going beyond the tax-free lump sum if you plan to do any more retirement saving. Just very briefly, I think I've only a moment or two left. Um, what's the future hold? Well, we can have another budget. Hurrah! It's only a few weeks since the last one, but, you know, another budget coming in early July. Uh, what are we going to see? It's already been announced that the lifetime tax allowance will come down from one and a quarter million to one million, adding... No doubt more complexity. A really, really complicated and obscure change, which is if you earn over 150,000 to 210,000, there'll be a tapered reduction in your annual allowance. We could have whole days of conference on why that's a ludicrous idea, but anyway, it's going to happen. But the other two things to watch out for are there's a lot of fuss at the moment in the press and elsewhere of people saying, I tried to get my cash and it was very difficult. So the government set up a review with the Financial Conduct Authority looking into two things exit penalties. So to get your money, you're being charged to take it out. Now, in many cases, there was already an exit fee in your contract. So that was like when they were going to get the commission back that you were not charged at the start. But that's something the government are looking at. And the other thing is the delays. You know, how long should it reasonably take to get hold of your money? Now, the industry is saying there's lots of other things we need to sort out as well, people giving up valuable guarantees and so on. So I think there will be more reviews, more changes and so on. One thing I haven't put on the slide is that next April 2016, people who have already bought an annuity may be able to sell it. That's the plan. And the Chancellor's already banked the tax revenues from that. <laughs> I make no comment on that fact. I simply observe that the Chancellor's banked the tax revenues, so it will probably happen. So if you've got an annuity in payment, you might be able to go to a website, say how old you are, what your health's like, how much is coming in, and see how much people will bid for in cash. That should come through sometime in 16, 17. And I think we may see, and probably rightly, more protections against scammers, because if there is one kind of public service message I would leave you with, there's a lot of crooks out there. You've probably worked that one out for yourself, but there's a hell of a lot of crooks out there. So I hope that whistle-stop tour gives you a sense of why we did some of these reforms, what we were trying to achieve. Some of them obviously very popular, all the freedoms, some of them unpopular, expecting people to work longer. I hope the new state pension ultimately will be simpler, fairer, and give people a basis to save. So I hope that's helpful as a starter. I'm going to head to the exhibition area and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.